Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value and The Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today, we're going to talk to Stansbury Research Asia-based analyst, Brian Taikango. And for today's rant, retail investors are back. Kathy Wood's ARK ETF is the new NASDAQ and more. Remember, you can email us at feedback at investorhour.com and tell us what's on your mind. That and more right now on the Stansbury Investor Hour. They're back. <laughs> so... Who's the, back? <laughs> yeah. So the headline at, on Market Watch is they're back. Retail participation in the stock market just surpassed the GameStop days. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And 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 they're sounding like me in the digest or something, calling them the great unwashed. <laughs> right yeah yeah I, I did i did laugh at that as well <laughs> yeah so um, the uh the tidbit here is near the end of january this is a quote from a, the market watch article near the end of january retail market orders as a percent of market value reached 23 percent on january 23rd according to data from jp morgan to put that in perspective it got to 22 percent a few times when gamestop first started surging in value and everyone was talking about Roaring Kitty and Reddit Wall Street bets. So I, I never heard of Roaring Kitty, I have to say. I don't think I have either. But yeah. You know, so you're not you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. I, it's just yeah, this is just it, it kinda it makes sense when you when you think of the the start to twenty twenty three that the markets have had. Uh, you know, it's I was looking at some of the numbers yesterday. It was like the best january for the nasdaq since like 2001 um and you know the s&p was up 10 percent or 11 percent. so it's um yeah people are eager to jump back in i guess the the retail the retail investors i the, the article went on to say you know it was the same popular stocks as amazon apple mm -hmm. um interestingly selling tesla was was up there in the in the data too so um, I, I right. don't know what, 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 what do you make of it? I don't know. Well, um, you know, retail investors being back to me, it's sort of, um, I've been looking for the blistering bear market rally and, you know, retail participation hitting a, you know, at least a short term record and, um, and just all of these crappy companies like Carvana and, um, Actually, Carvana is the main one. I could, I can't believe it. But even, even, um, you know, GameStop and AMC. I mean, they still have billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar market caps. They're, but they're zombies. I mean, they're they're dying, and yet here they are. And oh, by the way, you know, AMC has these two classes of stock that, for all practical intents and purposes are fu they're functionally identical they're the exact same thing and one of them is six bucks a share that's the regular amc share 650 ish to just call it lately and then the other one is like in the 270s and they're the exact same thing i mean i don't like retail investors are doing that i promise it's just <laughs> it's ridiculous they're the stupidity yeah, there's a, there's in the market a there's a meme etf yeah, uh, the ticker oh, yeah. is M E M E, and that's yep. up thirty eight percent. And and I know Bed Bath and Beyond. You know we've talked about it a couple of times. Uh, you know that was up, and they had they're like they're basically going out of business. So, yeah. um, they're having a going out of business sale. Uh, I guess every day. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 it's. I, yeah, I don't really know what to make of. I, I all of it. I, I guess it just shows you that there's still froth. Uh, there from from people who are trying to just make up from last year, most likely. I mean, Bitcoin's up forty um, percent. Yep. You know, it's it seems like just it was like the old days of the uh, end of <laughs> the right. end of twenty nineteen and twenty twenty and uh, and then twenty twenty one. It felt like in January of this year. So, 
all I can say is beware of this <laughs> this rally. And it, it, I mean, it's a pullback. I, I would be stunned if we don't see some kind of pullback from this. And um, just kind of know your time horizon there. If yeah, so. I mean, it's it's a classic bear market rally. They're getting back into all the same crap that crushed them out of existence. You know, including ARC, uh, Kathy Wood's ARC, which she has come out recently and said that ARC, which is still down 70%, up 40% year to date, but still down 70%. She says ARC is the new NASDAQ because back in, you know, dot com era, that was where you went in the 90s to invest in innovation. And and now she says that you don't go there for innovation. You know, it's a bunch of it's it's dominated by these big cap names that um, you know we all know: Amazon, Google, Meta, etc., um, and and Apple, of course, the biggest one. And uh, if you want to really invest in disruptive innovation, you need to buy her Arc Innovation <laughs> ETF. And you know something, Corey? I think she's right. Because just like the NASDAQ, I think the ARK Innovation ETF is going to go sideways for like 10 or 11 years and just do nothing and be a brutal disaster and take at least 15 years to make a new high, if it ever does again. I agree 100% with you and her, I guess. (laughs) You know, it was, that was my first thought when I saw, when I saw that headline was, yeah, it is the new NASDAQ because the NASDAQ imploded in the tech bubble. Oh. And that's what just happened. And now she <laughs> thinks it's this is back, you know, this is a rally back. I don't know how many percent it is, but it's still down, what, 70% since the, since, yes. uh, the beginning of 2021. I mean, gosh, I, I am, here's a rant. I am sick of Kathy Wood. I, <laughs> I would be happy never to think or hear from her again. However, I know that, she's worth talking about especially um and i think you agree for various reasons but i I would if i i listened to a little bit of that interview and and i i turned it off literally after 10 seconds i I just the one where she made this headline i I just i there's more there's better ways to spend your time and money i think than (laughs) with kathy wood yeah i i I completely agree with that like you you don't want to own these companies like it's so it's so uh clueless of her to say the new nasdaq when you know like a year after the bubble has burst right because if she if she looked at a chart of the nasdaq she would kind of notice what we just noticed and she said well you know maybe we're not the new nasdaq we're better than that blah 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 but um i don't know she's so earnest you know, she, I, I really think she's completely genuine. I mean, she's running a business, right? She's, she's not gonna, she's not going to come out and say, you know, I'm sorry, but I bought a bunch of worthless garbage and I'm shutting down the company. She's never going to do that. Um, nor is she going to tilt the portfolio toward quality. <laughs> I don't think, you know, she's going to persist with this idea of disruptive innovation, which was a fad and has always been a Spoiler alert, terrible investment. Like disruptive innovation is a terrible investment. You know, that's why the famous book by Clayton Christensen is called The Innovator's Dilemma, not The Innovator's Pot of Gold at the End of the Rainbow. (laughs) So I don't know. I just, uh, oh, Kathy Woods, for a guy who writes the digest once a week, most weeks, um, and likes to focus on the crazy people in this market, I, I, you know, she's the gift that keeps on giving, man. I'm, thank you, Kathy. Thanks so much. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, th- I think we have a theme of the week. The uh, crazy bull market was back mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> this week and in recent weeks. And yeah, of course, we're not sure what comes next. But yeah, so um, it's it's another insane. Well, I don't know if he's insane, but but an insane thing investors do is sit around waiting for Jerome Powell to speak, which he did last week after, you know, the usual presser after the FMC meeting, they raised interest rates a quarter point, the market loved it, et cetera, et cetera. What the market didn't love as much was Friday's jobs report, 
which was like somebody I saw on Twitter said it's like an eight sigma beat, meaning, you know, eight standard deviations above normal because the economy added like 500, I think it was 516,000 new jobs and they were expecting 187,000. I mean, I mean, that doesn't look like disinflation to me. Just top of my head, quick reaction, not disinflationary. Yeah, that to me was, I mean, when, when these reports missed by that much, it uh, shows you there's some uh, disjointed <laughs> thoughts out there in the market. And this, yeah, yeah to me, uh, what's the end game here? You know, the with a strong job market that isn't getting any weaker um, and decreasing, you know, disinflation at the at the moment, you know, pe- in, the, in the past, but... Mm-hmm. You know, if there's a strong job market, what's what's the end game? I think it's just higher wages and that wage price spiral, right? I mean, I, am I wrong there to think that what will happen ultimately if the Fed does what it says and sticks to its plan? Um, you know, they're not Ro- if well, they, or they have to kill the job the jobs market even more. Right. So that's that's the problem is that. Um, they're not getting all their their goals. They're not getting, you know, um, a, a labor market that looks the way they think it ought to look. I mean, you don't need, you know, it, it just, this doesn't look anything like what they want it to look. So, therefore, you must conclude, and to a certain limited extent, I suppose the stock market reflected that um, on Friday, but therefore, you must conclude that they're, you know, higher for longer, right? Rates are going to be higher for longer. And I think people calling for pivots and cuts, rate cuts this year, I think they're going to be disappointed. And the other thing is the cuts, if the cuts do come, it ain't going to be on good news, right? Right. It's like, it's that it's part the narrative, you know, some months ago is like, the bull case, the end of the world is the bull case, right? Because that's where you get your cuts from. So, and, and cuts don't come, um, you know, they come before the bottom. They don't come after it, right? So, I, yeah, I, cuts um, mean things are going wrong. Yeah. And not, not great. And the Fed thinks that the economy needs help. Right. Um, it's the, it's that so. moment in the, uh, in in you know the action movie when somebody whips out an epi pen and stabs him in the heart or something, you know what I'm saying? It's like yes. <laughs> cut, cut, cut. <laughs> it's a it's a or panic. the juice, right? The juice. Haven't you written in, in the past? The uh, yeah, you know, sticking yep. a steroid uh, shot yep. in your leg or something, or butt or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. juice in the market. That's exactly juicing. right. They're juicing. So I don't know. Um, I yeah, maintain that to me, my... that, that that's that's surprise that that was a surprising thing to me too, and I'm I, I'm guessing the it wasn't something the Fed wanted to see too that jobs number because it just makes their life a whole lot more complicated, and I think you know based on what you heard Powell saying last week, I think he, it sounded like he was just expecting the jobs market to get weaker at some point, and that is what they're banking on and inflation going down at the same time, but the. Yeah. It, it it you know the opposite's happening. I mean, I don't. People are, I guess, finally going back to work. Uh, <laughs> who who haven't been working and yeah. Um, you know, maybe that's a result of just getting finally past all the COVID stuff. Maybe that's inflation itself. People going back to work because they need they want, um, you know, they, they want to make money again or need to. Um, you yeah, know, a lot of this. I I haven't looked at the details of it. Like it it. it a lot, a lot of times these the headline numbers don't tell the full story. You know, it could be, you know, part-time jobs, could be second jobs, you know, that sort of thing, uh, which a lot of people work, uh, you mm-hmm. know, multiple, multiple jobs. And so um, it could be that sort of thing too. I don't know. But yeah. um, it, it definitely throws some uncertainty into the, the Fed story uh, for sure. Yeah. And, and um, you know, there's the, the disconnect between the market and, what the Fed has consistently said and what is still happening is is profound, I think, at this point. People still buying these, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to call them shit goes, right? They're the worst garbage <laughs> yeah. in the market is outperforming everything. 
It's like it's it's everything's okay. It's an all clear signal, and it's nothing like that. You, I continue to believe that you don't get out of the biggest financial mega bubble in all recorded history this easily. Powell said there will be pain. They're going to they're, they're they're going to maybe they'll pause at five and five and a half percent or five percent or whatever it is that's been talked about, but there's not going to be cutting. They're going to sit there and they're going to let it grind and grind and grind and they're going to wait until it shows up in housing. Lag or not, they're going to wait until they see it with their, you know, the whites, of the, the whites of housing's eyes, you know, and they're going to wait until data says inflation is absolutely done. And that is going to be, a, it's going to be an ugly time, I feel. We'll see. Yeah. If they actually do that, which they've they've indicated that uh, the whole time, um, you know, it's going to be a while. It's not it's not it's not going to be uh, six months from now. I don't think. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you. My, my base case is like, yeah, they they might do this to maybe this this number adds a couple more little rate hikes, uh, if yeah. anything. Um, but then they'll hold it there for as long as uh, as long as they deem necessary, and then. Who knows? You know, we haven't done deal, dealt with inflation like this in a long time. Who who knows what happens, like how the world actually reacts to, uh, you know, what's going on right now. What else happens in the world? So, um, you know, it could be. It's very easy for me to think of what what you've talked about the flip the twenty years on his head and just you know inflation's here right now. I mean, the rates are here right now. They stay here and then they go up, you know, mm-hmm. a, again and then we're on this cycle. We're on this. We're off on this long, yeah, long journey that nobody's seen in in a long time. But yep, and we'll and the whole world globally, like, like economically, being on a kind of a war footing, is also inflationary. And it's you know, think in terms of like economic war between you know East and West, between like U.S. and its aligned countries, and then Russia, China, their aligned countries. Um. That's that's also inflationary, and right. yeah, and, the Chinese spy balloon is inflationary. Yeah, the Chinese spy <laughs> balloon. There's uh, some that, kind of writing that? on yeah. it, and I was like, people are on Twitter were asking, well, can anyone understand what that says? And I thought it said something like, you know, eat at Chengdu's this week and get twenty percent off or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hopefully, see. I don't get an up close look at it. Yeah, we don't want an up close look. All right. Well, I think um, you know. I, 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 I'm I'm glad. I'm happy to leave people on a lighter note <laughs> with the Chinese spy balloon um, actually being a uh, a uh, you know an advertisement for Chinese with Brian, What it actually fits with Brian's uh, expertise, yeah. actually, right? Yeah, that's right. Speaking of China, there. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of China, let's talk to our good friend Brian Taikango. And let's actually do that because Brian is based in Asia and he, so he's, you know, he has this on the ground viewpoint and we'll see, we'll see what that gets us. He's a very insightful guy and he's been around Stansberry for years and years, been around the markets for decades. And let's, let's hear what he has to say about China and other things. Let's do it right now. Two legendary market experts are stepping forward to warn we're in the earliest stages of what they call the Great Unraveling, a specific event starting to take root in America that's behind the recent crash in stocks and the record inflation you're seeing. But they worry it's about to get even worse, and many of the things you take for granted are due to a big disruption in the months ahead. Your Social Security benefits will likely be slashed, your taxes are probably going way up, and many of your investments are likely to continue falling, meaning if you think you've saved enough money to retire, you're probably going to need way more money than you thought. Your personal success all comes down to how well you understand what's heading your way. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about their warning totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about the great unraveling. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.2023unraveling.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to get their full playbook to prepare for what's coming. Again, that's 
www.2023unraveling.com for a free copy of this new report. Okay, it's time for our interview once again. Today's guest is Brian Tykango. Brian joined Stansberry Research in 2019. He's based in Asia where he's lived all his life. His background is in finance with a bachelor's degree in economics. He's been working in the equities market since 1995, starting out as a trader and later as a financial analyst with BNP Paribas. Prior to joining Stansberry Research, Brian was editor of the Asian Growth Stocks newsletter for 17 years. Wow. He brings with him nearly 25 years of understanding and research experience concerning the Asian stock markets, including China. So lots of good stuff to talk about. Brian, welcome to the show. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me on. And so also, I should tell our listener, I have, of course, my co-host, Corey McLaughlin here, and we're going to gang up on Brian and see if we can uh, bring some good stuff out of him. That's right. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Hey, Corey. So, Brian, since you're new to the show, I thought I would sort of do my um, sort of classic first question for new guests, which is... If you and I sort of met in a bar and the conversation just turned to finance and I said, hey, what kind of investor are you? What would you say? What kind of investor are you? What kind of investor am I? That's that's a tough question to answer. I mean, every investor, I guess, and if I'm going to describe myself, would be an investor that really looks at how life has formed the way I look at investing. I mean, I look at my life as a journey. Uh, I started out in the weirdest of markets. I mean, I started in the Philippine market, which was very speculative. But I had a background in economics, and nothing seemed to make sense at first when I joined the equities market because everything I learned in college was about looking at things from a top-down perspective. Look at the economy, look at how it's going, how this applies to everything that I do. And here I am in this uh, small stock market in a small country in Asia, and everyone's asking me, what stock is going to go up today? How the hell should I know, right? (laughs) How the hell should I know? And that sort of put a lot of things in perspective, especially when I joined at the peak, what I would say just before the Asian financial crisis, when things were really doing well, just before things really hit the fan, and uh, how speculative the small markets had been brought me to realize that I wasn't doing things the way I wanted to do it. I wasn't learning from the industry the way I wanted to learn. And so I went into research. I decided to go into research for a big investment bank called BNP. And from there, I started learning how to do uh, fundamental analysis. And there I was finally able to use the things that I learned in my uh, college education, which is economics. So when you ask me what kind of investor I have become, I would say I'm more of a top-down kind of guy. I look at everything from a broader perspective, a macro perspective. I look at the growth in general. Uh, I look for the sectors that are going to benefit from that growth. And then that I zero in on the companies that I think are going to do the best. And that timed just perfectly as I exited the financial crisis. Um, China had joined the World Trade Organization around that time. And... It was just Greenfield. Everything was just so full of potential. And um, coming from where I am in Asia, you could feel the sense of excitement about China's opening. Right. And that brought me to realize that, hey, this is a mega trend that I have to keep an eye on and watch. And that sort of like fit into my investment thesis where, you know, you look for the uh, countries that are growing the fastest. And when you do that, it's not that difficult to find sectors that are going to do really well and companies that are going to do the best. And I take that approach in anything that I do in investing, because I do believe that if you really want to make money in the markets, you have to go where the growth is. And that, mm-hmm. that, that is a time-tested formula for success. Okay, so let's talk about China today. The narrative today is reopening. It's like every time somebody says the word China, they say the word reopening within five seconds. Is that what you see? Uh, Yeah. I mean, China has basically shut itself up from the world for three years. Uh, It did well for the first year and then it did horribly for the next two years. 2022 was obviously a very bad year. Wouldn't be surprised if they went into a very deep recession in 2022. 
their hand was finally forced to reopen. I think a lot of that was uh, influenced by the protests that came about in late 2022. And, you know, just seeing everybody around the world just basically maskless and and living a normal life again. There was a big clamor for a return to normalcy in China. So China has reopened and there is a lot to be hopeful for with this reopening. I mean, China accumulated, I mean, the Chinese households themselves accumulated about $4 trillion in additional savings during this lockdown. You'd say, how the hell do they accumulate $4 trillion in savings, right? Well, yeah. China clamped down on real estate. Uh, which was the number one go-to uh, asset for any Chinese family. They normally invest in real estate as a stable, safe way to grow their wealth. It's the same everywhere, uh, even where I live uh, in the Philippines, wherever I go in Asia, Chinese families just invest in real estate. It just it's a, it's a no-brainer for them. They buy more than one property, not just for themselves. They buy two, three sometimes even four bits of property, which they, you know, hand on to their kids and their daughters-to-be or our sons-in-laws to be. And it's 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 a sort of wealth and it's a sign that you've uh, moved up into the middle class. And that's why uh, when Beijing clamped down on real estate, it sort of shocked a lot of Chinese families into thinking, hey, this is no longer just a no-brainer safe Play to, way to invest. So a lot of them stopped buying up real estate for the best part of a year. And that contributed to the growth in excess savings in China. Uh, that apart from not being able to go out, uh, not being able to travel, you know, Chinese are one of the biggest travelers and spenders all over the world. And they haven't done that for three years. They mm -hmm. spend upwards of, uh, I think, around $60 billion a year internationally just on spending. So that was bottled up in China. So you have $4 trillion in accumulated savings now waiting to be unleashed into the world. And you know that's going to impact everything from tourism, travel, to luxury retail, hotel stocks, even casinos in Macau. I mean, the casino stocks in Macau have just been on fire lately because Macau used to generate up to six times the uh, gaming revenues as Las Vegas itself mm. at the height of the, the gambling craze. And uh, after COVID, that thing almost went down to zero. I mean, that's insane, right? So mm -hmm. the, the snapback in these stocks are justified. And it, and it just shows you the sheer magnitude of how much was lost and how much could be gained again once these mainlanders start flocking into Macau. You know, I've heard the... You know, long-term China story is a, is a popular one. It's, we've been telling it for, in a big way for 20 years or so. But another thing that I always wonder about with China, there, there's actually two things, two concerns. One mm. is sort of a bottom-up, you know, the, the, um, and this is Asia in general, the accounting, you know, and the, uh, I, I have a, a whole book that's devoted to reading Asian financial statements. And it's just, it's kind of hilarious, actually, um, because they say, well, well, you know, they print this, but they mean that <laughs> it could be opposite. So, so that's one thing. That's a bottom up concern I have. But the other concern that I have is top down in China, because when a guy declares himself president for life, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it doesn't exactly sound like a great, um, capitalistic free market society. It sounds like he's going to do whatever the hell he wants. And if the Chinese government wants to take your money, they'll take your money. It scares me a little bit. Am I being too paranoid? No, no, you're not. I mean, that, that's definitely a concern that's going to be around for a lot of foreign investors. When everyone deals with China, that's going to have to be factored into the risk. You see, I mean, I can't sugarcoat it. I mean, that that is really the case right now. Xi Jinping has really cemented his grip uh, on power in China, whether for good or for worse. The way that China works is not the same as America, it's just totally different. Are people okay with it in general? Yes, I would say yes in China. Um, 
the way that the Chinese society works, even government, is really very patriarchal. You know, I was born and raised by a Chinese family. And that's really how it does. I mean, you, you have a leader that you trust will do the job for you. And as long as he's doing his job, people are basically quiet and don't just let him do whatever he wants, right? Most Chinese really just want to go on with their lives, being able to feed their families, send their kids to a good school, have the promise of a good life, not necessarily a wonderful life, but a good life um, mm -hmm. for most of the middle class. And that's why I see that something tipped a few years ago when there was a lot of inequality spreading throughout China. The cost of education was soaring. Um, a lot of people were getting feeling that they were getting left behind. Uh, you had people spending too much money in things that are not priorities. When I say that, I mean, look at uh, online gaming, for instance, wherein you had kids that were you know, spending hours and hours and nights on video games, which in a normal, you know, free open society, go ahead, you know, let, it's really up to the parents to, dis to, to discipline the kids, right? But here right. what happened was sort of like Beijing stepped in and became the parent, like, okay, I'm going to have to be the big, big person here and step up and, and start implementing some rules here so that you guys don't need to have to control your family, right? So that you, mm. you can actually go back to a, some, some sort of normalcy in your life. So kids are no longer allowed to play video games 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're only allowed to play video games from this hour to that hour. And that sort of like shocked a lot of people. Well, they, it's not the Western way, is it? It's, I mean, it's, it's shocking, but it's only shocking to a Western mentality. Was it shocking to the Chinese? It wasn't shocking to the Chinese. They sort of kind of like wanted it. I didn't, uh, nobody, <laughs> no. Nobody, nobody went in an uproar. There were, there wasn't a society, society um, uproar when Beijing implemented these rules. No, there weren't families that were saying, "Hey, you can't do that." They actually wanted it. And when you had, we all want it, Brian. Anybody with kids wants it anywhere, exactly, in the world, whether we admit it or not. Exactly. <laughs> we we don't want it. We don't want to say they were right <laughs> doing it, but it's the right thing. No. And well, right. Yeah, now Dan Brian, the the uh, the thing the the thing that didn't like it though was was the markets, right? That was you know, 2022, and everybody kind of you know kind of freaked out over the regulations and what what was coming next. And yeah, um, you know, it's it's easy to forget about that now, given that the big story with China is the the reopening. But I think last year, the big story was you know you had the Evergrande, like you mentioned, the real estate, and then all these regulations coming in. And nobody knowing when it was ending. I mean, it's just that was, uh, you know, and now you're talking about a rally getting started in Chinese equities. So it's it's it, is that right? You know, there's a lot of things that I think are, are what I hear is that there's all this, this savings spent up and maybe the regulation stories behind, you know, that was a risk that to the American markets for sure. But, um, you know, is this rally getting started in, in China right now? Yeah, I think it's just getting started. Look, um, on the regulatory front, we had two, maybe three years of real adjustment that, that went on. And that that rattled the markets, that made everyone run, run for cover because nobody knew what was going to be next, right? Nobody knew what kind of new regulation was going to come out next, especially with um, Ant Financial, the Ant IPO being pulled back in 2019, what would have been the world's largest IPO ever. Uh, man, that just set the tone for the next couple of years, basically. Uh, what appeared to the West or what appeared outside of China was basically, okay, you can no longer do business the way you're, you're, you want to do, you were doing business before. Here are the new rules. And nobody knew if these companies were going to be able to adhere to these new rules. It was just a big question mark, right? What is coming to, uh, to, uh, to be known now slowly is that, yes, one by one, these companies are able to adhere to these rules. And these companies are finding new ways to grow their business within these new parameters. So that is one thing that people are going to be looking at going into 2023. 
So you had this massive snapback rally in Chinese equities from the lows of October. And that was just to get us from down 90% to just down 80% or down 75%, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you get the, the next 75% and make up more than that? It's really just proving that you can now grow again in this, in this new environment. How fast companies are able to do that, we don't know yet. There's still a lot of questions left unanswered. I think we'll see that in the next couple of quarters. The reopening is going to be driving a lot of this growth. Uh, like I said, a lot of these companies suffered not just from regulation, but just but also from the lockdowns, the COVID lockdowns. So it's like a, a double whammy, even a triple whammy when you think about you know the the general malaise in the economy. Sure. So you have so much going against all these Chinese companies before, and now slowly one thing and another thing is going in its favor. But that doesn't mean that we're going to go back to normal. That doesn't mean we're going to go back no. the way things were in 2020, 2020, uh, 2019. No, we've, as a matter of fact, we've had guests on this show, like macro analysts who said, you know, make sure you get all your people out of China because it's going to get bad. But, you know, the, there's it's a big world. There's plenty of room for lots of viewpoints. But what I'm hearing with you, Brian, though, is like you've been focused on Asia for more than two decades. Like you're an Asia focused top down analyst. And still, it sounds to me like you find a certain opaqueness about China so that you're being caught. What you just expressed to me was was some caution. You said Let's wait and see. Let's wait and see what the next set of rules is. Let's see if it's, you know, pro business and pro sort of middle class free society in a, in a Western kind of, at least in a way that the West can understand. They'll do it the way China does everything. But, you know, let's see if we can sort of get a good feeling about the direction that China is headed in. So you're not willing to go out on a limb. I find that very interesting. And I have to say, it kind of is a characteristic of the best top-down Asian analysts, even when they're located in Asia. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, it's hard to say, pack your things and get out of China when you're, like me, based in Asia, and you deal with a lot of people who deal with a lot of people in China every day. I mean, mm -hmm. I talk to so many people who basically get 100% of their business from China, and things are just normal back there. I mean, it, it, nobody is right. packing... I, I don't hear about any businessman in China who wants to pack up their bags, any Chinese, rich Chinese who wants to, you know, get out of China as soon as quickly as they can. That's not happening. A lot of people just want to get back to business and they are now getting back to business. As long as you can provide that environment in China, I think that it, it lends to the, it's just, it's, it's something that we're just not used to in the West, but Mm -hmm. When you are here, you don't get the same sense of foreboding uh, that you do when you listen to all these crazy headlines in mainstream media, all these alarming headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I'm not saying everything is rosy, but everything is not as bad as it seems. If you talk to, you know, here's something that's always stuck to my mind. Speaking with some of the biggest you know, tycoons in the Philippines who have a lot of businesses in China, they have always had this great outlook for China. I mean, this is the place to be. And they don't look at it as, you know, oh, this is a great place to be just as long as blah, 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 blah. This is really the, the place to be. Because if you look at the Chinese people. Oh, you look, unconditionally. You look, unconditionally. You look at how great... entrepreneurial there are. Um, uh -huh. You put a Chinese guy anywhere in the planet. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're going to find a way yeah. to make money. Um, I'm yeah. not saying it's going to be yeah, the best way, but yeah, it, they're just so entrepreneurial and resourceful. And most of the Asian economies really are dominated by either, you know, Chinese families or uh, families with Chinese linkage. Um, and they, they see, they see the dynamic going on here and they see just how, how important China will continue to be, not just to business, but to uh, both stability in the region mm -hmm. and uh, just the outlook itself. I mean, I'm not at all getting any signs of alarm from our end. 
It's just okay. you know, back to business. In other words, people you know who have a lot of money to invest, they're as bullish on China for the long term as ever. And unconditionally, they say, yeah, China is the place to be. Yeah, yeah. Period. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like, and okay. I, that, that reminded me of, you know, when you're talking about the headlines, like the, the geopolitical headlines that we get over here in the U.S. about Asia, mm-hmm. China, Taiwan, you know, everybody over in the U.S. Think, thinks they're an expert on Asian geopolitics. But um, <laughs> to me, it seems like if you're an investor and you understand that, yeah, the risk of regulation and maybe unforeseen moves from the government uh, is a risk to have. Mm -hmm. But if you actually understand what's going on in China, like you do, and the long-term opportunities here could be, you know, like you said, the markets are down 90% over there. So it's like, if you actually understand and go beyond the headlines a bit, even just a Mm -hmm. little bit, it seems like you could find kind of the opportunities that you do. Yeah. I mean, so I I still want to talk about something else here, Brian. So a moment ago I said, you know, all the good Asian analysts seem to accept a certain inscrutability or, or opaqueness about China. And they're not willing generally to go out on a limb about it. It's always very wait and see when China's up to something that people aren't sure about. Then on the other hand, you just told me that like wealthy investors who you know on the ground in Philippines view it as the place to be unconditionally. Like, like none of us are billionaires like are the four, you know, the three of us, are we being too, too paranoid and too Western in our thinking? Do we need no. to adopt some of that uh, Filipino, <laughs> you know, tycoon mentality? No, it, it, I think it's just being practical. I mean, seeing what's happened over the past three years, you need to be open to the, the possibility that something like that could happen again. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. sure. And that, that should be baked into your decision-making. I mean, if you, you don't you don't go go all in on China, but you don't also not have exposure to a place like this. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's always, I would say, there's always a room for China in anyone's portfolio. It definitely is, the, you know, the second largest country in the world, second largest economy in the world. It's probably going to be the fastest growing economy in 2023, uh, if not you know, next to uh, India, maybe. So. There's definitely a lot of potential there. So it would be crazy not to have exposure just because of what you think are geopolitics and what might be Xi Jinping's desire to control things once again, right? That's always a possibility. But the way things are headed now, that tells us that, okay, Beijing has already set the ground rules for these tech companies. Mm -hmm. They've taken small stakes Here's one thing. There's 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 been this article about these golden shares of these Chinese companies in uh, of the the government in these uh, Chinese companies. That right. that raised a lot of concern. But for me, I think that it's actually a positive since now that the government has taken a small minor stake in these companies, it's now ready to just let them. Okay, now that we set the rules, you're now ready to grow. You understand what the rules are. We're here just to make sure we have a say in what goes on. But how you grow your business, okay, now based on these new parameters, it's really up to you. Well, that's what 2023 is going to be all about, whether it be JD.com, Alibaba, Tencent, Hinduoduo. We're going to see these companies now prove that they can grow in these new parameters. And if they don't, they're going to be punished accordingly by the shareholders, by the market. Okay. So what I'm hearing, like, let's, let's get back in Warren Buffett mentality. Like Buffett says, when you see a really high quality business that's had kind of a one-time severe problem, you should buy it because the price is not going to be depressed for long. And it sounds to me like between you and your Filipino tycoons, China is the high quality business that you should buy on the dips for the long term. So when Xi, you know, she doesn't want to, he doesn't want to ruin this for people. He doesn't want to go back to, you know, the way things used to be, right? He wants people to be wealthy. He wants there to be a middle class. We assume he also likes having control over other people's lives. So, (laughs) you know, there's a little conflict there, but it seems to me what I'm getting out of everything you said, Brian, is 
it's it's the Warren Buffett situation. When you see a situation in China where a rule comes out that the West just doesn't get or, you know, things look like, you know, he looks like he's clamping down in a way we don't understand. It's not over. It's just different than you thought. And it's probably a good idea to buy those massive dips if you are a truly long term investor in China, it sounds like. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. That's exactly the point there. And everyone needs to realize just how young China's stock market is. It's a very young stock market. So it's still evolving. There's still very low investor participation in the stock market. Just a tiny fraction of Chinese savings are actually invested in the stock market. So as this evolves, you're going to see a lot more policy towards the development of the stock market. For instance, China just launched the you know their first uh, privately run pension fund, right? It's like the uh, the four hundred one k, and this is going to be uh, a major driving force for the stock market as as the Chinese move away their savings from the traditional real estate investment and park it into the stock market. What else? They're now slowly opening up their capital markets to foreign investors. And they they haven't stopped. They haven't stopped. They just keep on opening up one one after another, new policy after another. They're opening up and the money is flowing in. Uh, mm-hmm. Second, they're starting to make foreign, foreign stocks more accessible to mainland investors through the Stock Connect. Uh, the Stock Connect, um, a lot of people don't understand, is, is a because mainlanders aren't really allowed to buy shares overseas. So it's, a, it's mm-hmm. one of their ways uh, to control capital. But through the Stock Connect program, um, qualified investors in, mainland, in the mainland can buy Hong Kong listed stocks through their mainland stock broker. And this has actually been growing tremendously over the past few years, uh, more, more particularly this past year where they started allowing some of the tech stocks to be included in this Stock Connect program. They even included mm-hmm. ETFs in the Stock Connect program. And one thing I've been, I've been writing about in, in, on social media and Twitter is how the ETF uh, is being used as a backdoor to invest in a lot of these uh, U.S.-listed Chinese tech stocks. The companies like mm-hmm. Alibaba, Billy Billy, JD.com that aren't yet included in the Stock Connect, they're all p- part of this ETF called the Hang Seng Tech ETF. And although you cannot buy, if you were a mainland investor, you cannot buy these shares through the Stock Connect, you can buy the ETF that holds these stocks, right? And that mm-hmm. that's sort of like the back way. And since October... The ownership in one of these ETFs that does this has gone from almost nothing, like 3%, to 25% as of today. So mainland investors now own one-fourth of this entire ETF through the Stock Connect. And that, okay. if you are going to be clamping down on, on companies again, why would you allow your own people to be buying shares in the very companies that would get hurt from these policies. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Right. But of course, anything can happen. Of course, you know, the control (laughs) is paramount always. But then again, you look at these things and you have to take them in consideration, maybe say, hey, yes, there's a big fear out there, but then you have these conflicting um, Mm -hmm. developments. And I say, you know, is, you know, are the valuations worth the risk that I'm taking? Exactly. Just normal investor considerations, in other words. And that's kind of a hint, too, isn't it? If you can, if you can just think in a normal way about investing in China, maybe that tells you something. But yeah. Overall, sounds like if you've got a decade plus, I'm going to say, timeline, um, sure, there's, there's always a wait and see, you know, feeling. But it's like you said, at the very least, you can't afford not to have the exposure. Um, I find that very, very compelling and interesting. Um, and I personally have maintained some consistent exposure. And right now I'm kind of glad that I did. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so Brian, before I get to my final question, there, there's a whole topic that we haven't covered that I want to cover with you. 
and that is commodities specifically like oil and gold and whatever else you see out there. I know you're interested in this. What do you what do you see in these days? Maybe yeah. start with oil. Yeah, so I, I help write the commodity super cycles uh, along with uh, Bill McGilton. And uh, we've been very bullish on commodities for a while. We think we're entering a second phase in the commodity super cycle after last year's major sell-off in a lot of these commodities, mostly being driven by, you know, the the drive for, I mean, being driven by the uh, the, nat- the clean energy revolution, uh, mm-hmm. copper, zinc. These are all, you know, inventories at almost record lows, but then demand is still surging. Uh, you just look at the EV numbers coming out of China. You have almost 30% EV penetration rate over there for every new car being sold globally. Uh, we only have, how's that, maybe less than 10% EV penetration. But then the average EV consumes or takes up almost 10 times as much copper as your normal internal combustion engine car. So that imagine EVs taking up 50% of every car being sold globally. Um, and China plays into a lot of that because they're the ones that are leading the charge into lower cost EVs. Uh, India, I think, is going to be the next bulwark in terms of uh, low cost EVs. A company there called Tata Motors. It's a still, still a very small market, but their EVs are just flying off the showrooms because of, uh, of the low cost and mm-hmm. practicality there. Anyway, but, but going commodities, still a lot of things going on in geopolitics uh, you, with the Ukraine uh, situation that are um, underpinning the strength in the oil markets, natural gas markets, despite the correction recently. You have China coming back online, uh, opening up to the world with demand set to grow alongside its economy. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe five, six percent for China's economic growth this year. Uh, and that's going to figure a lot into oil consumption and natural gas consumption. A recovery in their real estate market, which seems like they're hell bent on achieving. What you have to f- understand is most of the uh, the new homes, or all of the new homes being almost all of the new homes being sold in China, are really condominiums, where you have natural gas piped into these condominiums, and that figured a lot into the growth in demand for la- natural gas uh, throughout China over the past 10 years as a lot of these cities become connected to the gas network. That's underpinning demand. For gold, I mean, you saw that gold demand among central banks has skyrocketed last year, most notably from countries like China, Russia, uh, the Middle East, and even emerging markets have been buying up gold, not because of a lack of faith in the dollar, but more of, I think, a worry about the geopolitics where it's headed, especially yep. with Ukraine and the things uh, happening between China and the U.S. over Taiwan. Uh, here's the thing: you know, the commodity super cycle doesn't end just because you have one small correction. The commodity super super cycle ends when you have a total destruction in demand, and that that's not going to happen anytime soon. I don't think I don't see it happening. We don't see it happening. Emerging markets are, you know, roaring ahead. Got countries like the Philippines, India, um, Latin America, all set to post significant growth. So you can't have a bad commodities uh, market when you have these kinds of growths coming down the pipe. And Brian, one of the the things that I, I keep thinking about is, you know, whether you believe in the renewable energy push or not like it's happening right and so when these uh, you know if you're moving or from from you know whatever the the conventional energy sources to these new energy sources i mean i still don't think people are fully aware of like what goes into those sources and so i'm assuming that a lot of the places that you're familiar with and cover produce these sort of metals and and whatnot that can be used in these new battery systems, the electric vehicles, you know, whatever it may be. Is that true? Do you see that sort of crossover between the commodities and the emerging markets right now? Yeah, I mean, look, the a lot of the uh, the materials used in the, the, the clean energy industry 
are derived from emerging markets. So you have these markets benefiting from that demand. Uh, you have things like copper and zinc, nickel. I mean, the Philippines is one of the three largest producers of nickel in the world and exporters. Um, Did not know that. So this tiny country in Southeast Asia is one of the biggest nickel producers in the world. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to benefit us immensely with this clean energy revolution. Uh, whether it's going to be a massive revolution or it's going to be uh, slow but steady, I think that it's, it's, it's a mega trend that is already set in stone. Um, I think, I mean, just look at China with its EV penetration, and it's really just a matter of both policy and demand. There's a lot of demand. People are, are changing, trading in their ICE cars for EVs. The price has gotten low enough to make it practical. It's gotten, you know, even cheaper than some normal cars. And you have this massive infrastructure that supports the EV industries. There are almost 2 million charging stations all over China. That's insane, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. and wow. when you have that kind of support, whether it's going to be a fast charging station or a battery swapping station, here you have a lot of confidence to own an EV. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't buy one, even if my life depended on it here in the Philippines. Um, right. I would wait. Um, I have actually a neighbor who bought a Tesla Model Y, and I asked him, how the hell do you charge that thing? And they say, you know, we hardly use it, but it's just parked at home and we charge it at home. And I've only <laughs> seen them use it once going to the grocery. So it just doesn't make any sense, right? But my neighbor does the same thing here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have, but you have this thinking now that, yeah, it's acceptable. I want to now own an EV, but just make it practical for me to own one, right? So there's, there is that thing going out there. And it's surprising to see that happening in places like Asia. And I think that it doesn't have to be full EV, hybrid vehicles that run on both battery and gasoline are going to take off in a lot of emerging markets that don't have the financial capability to roll out these massive charging infrastructure. So I, I think that's going to go. And, and they, they consume a lot more copper and zinc and nickel than the average uh, internal combustion engine. So, you know, you, you see it happening all over. And, and I, I think that, uh, that that is real and that is tangible. Um, and that's why we believe that um, this this commodity bull market is not yet over. Um, and like I said, back to inventories, there are still really crazy, uh, uh, um, not to say record lows, but five-year lows on the LMA, copper, aluminum, zinc, lead. Um, most of these are, are near record lows, and you have mm -hmm. a continuing growth in demand for clean energy. Um, solar power installations, wind power installations, hydropower Installations are all growing, and these consume enormous amounts of these materials. What I wonder about in the clean energy, and I and I think the thesis is right. It's a reason to. It's also a reason to own oil, frankly. But um, right, yeah. That's what it. I wonder about with clean energy thesis is, like, how soon are we going to acknowledge? You know, like, how soon are we going to acknowledge that it's not clean? It's horribly inefficient technology. Solar panels are terrible. Like you can't invent a worse way to generate electricity, you know, and windmills are, I mean, they literally mow down forests to put up windmills in some places. And they had come with their own environmental problems, you know, not to mention the fact that they're made of massive quantities of steel and the internal organs mm -hmm. are bathed in this extraordinarily expensive fossil fuel oil and you know energy density for for electric vehicles like we're not it's not even close with internal combustion you know the amount of fuel it takes to go 20 miles is like tiny compared to like 400 kilograms of batteries you know what i'm saying it's just it's not not even close so technologically this stuff sucks it's terrible when, I wonder when that reality, like, when is that reality going to hit? You know, for me, the commodity super cycle, if it's real, and I believe it, it 
just might be. I don't necessarily think it's only about clean energy. Um, you know, it's just about the world opening up and growing more. And and the narrative right now is the end of globalization. And that's, you know, kind of masks the, the reality. Anyway, my two cents. Dan, I think to to answer your your sort of rhetorical question, I, I think <laughs> when the prices for all these things keep going up and up is when that'll that'll hit some people over the head. And what that's what Brian's talking about with the commodity super cycle. You know, it's you know, and the price of oil going up as we've you know, as we all talk about too, you know, at the same time because of these things. So I do think, in all seriousness, I think the prices going up will will make people realize that. That's true. Yeah, and yeah. And, and I think Brian's spot on. Like, you must have exposure to these things because sooner or later, um, we're going to run into the fact that we don't have enough of any of them to get to any of the climate goals. They're they're just the physical yeah. supply is, you know, the capex is like down into the right. The supply is down into the right. It's just. Um, we're going to run into like really spiky, nasty action, um, like what happened on the LME with with nickel a while back, and and that's like when you get a whole bunch of that price action, you, it might mm-hmm. be a hint. <laughs> yeah, know? and Brian will be saying take profits, and he'll yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree that that is that is a likelihood. Yeah. All right, Brian. Well, so we've arrived at the moment when I ask my final question. It's the same question for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's non-financial, doesn't matter. Same question. And the question is simply, Brian, if you could leave our listener with a single thought, what would it be? Everyone needs to not just listen to the news. I think you have to be able to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. I mean, a lot of us just want to listen to the news and be told what to do. We have to be able to step out of our comfort zone and look at what's really going on in the world. And I think that just doing that simple thing is going to help us, any reader, any investor, make better investment decisions. Boom. Perfect. Love it. It takes work. Yeah. (laughs) Investing takes work. Yeah. I, I, I love that message. I think I wish I heard it more often. Um, So thanks for being here, and we will definitely be uh, talking to you again, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Hey, thanks for having me on. Great talking to you both. Many mainstream analysts are predicting that stocks will recover soon, but I say we'll instead witness a cash frenzy unlike we've experienced in 21 years before stocks recover. And I'm urging Americans not to buy a single stock until they see it. I predicted the Lehman Brothers crash in 2008, and I called the top of the NASDAQ in 2021. But this, this is the number one most important thing to pay attention to for 2023. And I'm not talking about another market crash or politics or inflation or any of these other things. As all this unfolds, the financial consequences of what I'm talking about could last for several decades if you don't understand what's happening. There will be winners and losers, and now is the time to decide which one you'll be. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about my warning totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.stockdeadzone.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to get my four steps to prepare for what's coming. Again, that's www.stockdeadzone for a free copy of this new report. Okay, so Corey, I'm going to go to you first. What are your takeaways from talking with Brian? A bunch. You know, he covered a lot there. I felt like we could have talked to him for or he could have talked for uh, forever there and we would have kept learning things yeah. or at least I would have. I guess the first thing, it feels like, you know, when he's talking about the excess savings um, that the Chinese people have uh, gathered over the last year or so, $4 trillion. To me, that sounds like a uh, the U.S. stimulus uh, package uh, from two, yeah. from two years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if that's true and, and the Chinese people have really saved up and haven't been buying second, third and fourth homes and um, they're getting through their first real serious bout with COVID, you could basically map the timeline from U S onto China two years later. And there you go. Um, 
that's one yeah. thing. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of a lot of this, the other cultural aspects about China and the and Asia. You know, were mm-hmm. great great to hear from somebody who's there and understands these things a lot better than I do. And yeah, yeah, and, and his take on on commodities too. Um, you know, Brian does does some some great work at that. You don't get a lot in this industry from people who are, you know, based in Asia, uh, writing to mm-hmm. a U.S. audience. So I really think, you know, no matter your thoughts on China or Asia, I think he's a valuable guy to follow. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I'm adding him to my, my my two takeaways are the the impression I got from, you know, Brian and his Filipino, uh, you know, tycoon uh, posse is... If you have a lot of money in a long timeline, China's a no-brainer. And when whenever they do something or whenever they go through one of these huge drawdowns, um, you should just buy it like a high-quality stock, like Warren Buffett says to buy a high-quality stock. And at the same time, the other takeaway for me is that I'm adding Brian to my growing list of Asian analysts based in Asia. You know, most of them are like working for big banks and stuff, but but the the idea of having some boots on the ground in Asia to me, it's kind of diluted over the years because all I hear is be very careful. <laughs> be very careful with China. Be very careful with Asian accounting. It's like all they, you know, they're just confirming the sense of caution that you ought to have anyway. So, and you know, there are people who practically made their careers out of shorting Chinese frauds and things. So <laughs> It, it all, it's all adding up. It's all starting to add up. And I think one day this will not be true. Like, you know, there will be, I think there will be some more transparency in just Chinese financial markets and Chinese people will eventually get more confidence in their own financial assets and put more of their savings in it, you know, sort of American style. But we'll see, won't we? <laughs> we will see. Yeah, see. I, I did think he, he painted a good picture of what the the current environment is over there. And uh, mm-hmm. so it was nice to hear. Yeah. Yep. I'm encouraged. I'm, I'm happy to have my Chinese exposure. All right. Well, that is um, another interview and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. Do me a favor, too. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want us to interview? Drop us a note. Feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my co-host, Corey McLaughlin, till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. 
Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.